We all know that the new Land Rover Defender will end up on streets like this, the urban jungle, where there is nothing more stressful to tackle than, well, a puddle or a high curb or a herd of Saturday shoppers. Why is that? Simply because it's desirable. But in order for it to have that desirability, that kudos, it also has to have credibility. And in order to get that, it has to be driven, it has to prove itself somewhere like here. It was clear from the outset that this was going to be a test like nothing I had ever experienced before. After dressing as the human embodiment of 7-Up's Fido Dido and boarding a medium-sized turboprop, a Beechcraft 1900D if you're interested, we flew from the capital of Namibia, Windhoek, up to Apoo in the northwest Kunene region of the country. This is where we met our Defender, an Indus Silver P400. From here we would be embarking on a three-day drive through what I hoped would be not only stunning scenery, but more importantly, truly testing terrain. Because let's be very clear about this, the new Defender needs to be reliable. And I hoped this journey would put it, and the seven others in our group, under enough stress to weasel out any weaknesses. Anyway, enough preamble, wagons roll. First day, first impressions, we've done about 65 kilometres, mostly on these sort of gravel roads. But I just thought I'd give some of my initial thoughts because they're the sort of things that after three days living with a car, you just become accustomed to things, don't you? And you, you don't don't notice them anymore. The first thing to say is that the air suspension on this car, which is pretty much standard across all of the new Defenders, is amazing. I mean, this is a fairly rocky sort of gravel road. We're doing 60 miles an hour there. And it's no less comfortable, really, than being on a tarmac road. Yes, you know, tiny, you feel a little bit of vibration, but that's just telling you what the road surface is like. It is amazingly comfortable. Other things I really like, getting into this, the interior is something that, yes, it's very nice to expect. We've got a touch screen down here. It's, you know, it's a world away from old Defender, but there's still a sparsity to it. Apparently, if you look through all the marketing, press material, whatever, you won't see it referred to anywhere as an SUV. This is, this is an off-roader. It doesn't feel like it's been overloaded with luxury. And that's, that's really nice. That feels, that's as it should be. This sparse authenticity is even more apparent in the paired back bottom of the range models. That's how I'd spec mine. No frills at all, just cloth covering the seats and not even an armrest centre console. And that's the reason why these buttons and the gear selectors all up here as well. So you can just have this open area down here if you want. But it, it feels smaller than you might think in this interior. I mean, it's, it's obviously an awful lot better than an old Defender where I would have been crammed up against this window here and a lot more comfortable. But there's still a sort of utilitarian feel to the interior of this, which I, I really like. Oh, ostrich! Running. Excuse me while I get excited. Heaven knows what I'll do if we stumble across a giraffe. Or springbok. Or kudu. Perhaps I should keep a little sort of one of those eye spy books. Just tick them off. Bing! 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 Clearly it was time for a break. And a walk around of our top of the range 110, which came equipped with one crucial set of accessories. Appropriately for the car that we've got, we have the Explorer pack. You may remember the various packs you can have with these things. So, black bonnet decals, the least useful, I think. Wheel arch protectors. Then as we move down here, we have the snorkel. So it means you can obviously wade through water, which we may get to experience at some point. The roof rack with a dynamic load capacity of 168 kilos, which is quite a lot of things going through corners with all that weight swinging around up high move further down here, on the other side, we have the external storage, which is both lockable and waterproof. So for sort of gear, you to leap out and you have it there to hand. And of course, the ladder, both of which actually sort of, this was quite a odd styling detail that people weren't sure about, this square here. So if you get the Explorer pack, then it sort of covers that up a bit. You also get a cover for the rear-mounted spare wheel. In terms of the overall look of the car, 
I think it's really nice to see it out, sort of not in a studio or a sort of a, a set environment, just seeing it in this landscape. It is a really, really good looking car. And in the same way that the new Mini captured the sprightly but friendly appearance of its forebear, so I think the design of this new Defender has an innately adventurous demeanour, like its predecessor. Just looking at it makes you want to head off the beaten track. Talking of which... I've just had a quick look at the sat-nav, and I kind of expected it just to be a blank screen out here, really. But amazingly, this is actually a road with a name. This is the D3703, 3703, the 3703. It's quite unlike any named road I've ever been on before. Oh, look, there's some other traffic. Traffic, you see, it's, it's, clearly it's just a, it's a busy thoroughfare. Named or otherwise, it was an incredibly long trail, which gave me time to ponder. Why is it that some people don't see this as a true successor to an old Defender? Is it the design? Is it the switch from a body on frame to a unibody? Is it just too modern, too different? Should Land Rover have gone down the G-Wagon route? I suppose what I'm trying to say is that a lot of people struggle to see this as a new Defender because it is such a huge step change from the old one. But I think there is another way of looking at that. Apparently the first time they actually considered redoing the Defender, as it were, was back in 1971, so 50 years ago. And they've had various iterations since. They've actually had about six or seven attempts at producing a new Defender, and this is the one that finally, finally has got off the ground and we're driving. So if you imagine all those iterations that perhaps should have taken place in the interim, then the step wouldn't seem as big as it does between old Defender and new. For a quirky comparison, imagine if Ferrari hadn't brought out any front-engine V12s between the 250 GTO and the 812 Superfast. There would probably have been uproar. It's lost all its charm and character. What's all this grip and why is it so fast? Anyway, in Namibia, night, like me trying to surf, falls quickly. And before we knew it, day one was over. Fires had been lit and sleep was very definitely needed for what lay ahead. Welcome to day two. At the moment, I'm halfway along Van Sills Pass. Now this is um, the most difficult off-road trail in all of Namibia. And you join me at the top of the most difficult bit. I'm a little bit scared actually, because I'm basically, I'm, I put my trust in, in the person that's gonna stand there and he's gonna stand there and speed is with that hand and then steering's like that. So if I don't look at the camera, at you, it's because my life is in somebody else's hands and I need to very much concentrate on what they're doing. So the car is in, let's check. So I go into terrain there and I've selected rock crawl so I can see both diffs are locked. And we've got the hill descent as well. We're in high, so we're in, we've got the air suspension raised up and we're in low ratio as well. Here comes Alex. Okay. He's going to explain exactly what's going to happen. This is the exciting bit. <laughs> <laughs> so you can kind of see uh, where we're going. Um, we want to be in low range, which we are, in rock crawl, which we are, of course, and hill descent on uh, on minimum. So if you want to bring it down a couple of clicks so it's right at its, uh, its lowest, probably won't use it for this first section. Okay. But once you're through mat and you're carrying on down, you should then be able to just take your feet away and let the hill descent take you down. Okay. As you can see, it's just nice and slowly, nice and gently. You may find the gradient release control comes in. If you stop the car mm -hmm. on a steep slope, the gradient release control feathers the brake off slowly. So you might find okay. as you're releasing, it's not moving. Don't be tempted to give it any accelerator. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, just be patient and it, it will release gently. It's, that's what it's designed to do. It's Absolutely. the gradient release controls. We've got the ride height set up. Is yeah, that... we're, for, we're in off-road yep. height. So yep. yeah, we've got maximum ground clearance. 
So we're all good and ready to go. Okay. Fantastic. I will, I will be watching you. Perfect. Good stuff. <laughs> right. I would literally rather be doing a fifth gear oversteer shot right now. Cars are just, just slithering down. I think there are some cars off to the side of the valley down there that have crashed. All my trust is in him. I dread to think what faces I'm pulling whilst doing this. Van Zyl's Pass is named after Benjamin Van Zyl, the clearly mad Dutchman. Incredibly, he forged this trail in the 1920s with a Model T Ford and the help of hundreds of local Himba tribespeople, who presumably simply carried the car. It took him many months, but that he did it at all is remarkable. That just feels absurd. And even when you're sort of up like that and you sort of, you can tell wheels are off the ground and yet it finds tractions and climbs over and things and yeah. <laughs> it's so much fun as well. <laughs> Certainly even the steepest speed humps or gnarliest curves in London shouldn't pose a problem. There was still plenty more of the pass to travel and I soon found I was tackling substantially tricky sections with all the carefree nonchalance of a baboon scratching its behind. As well as all the suspension and transmission trickery, I found one of the most useful things was the screen showing the feeds from the off-road cameras, which are situated under the wing mirrors and point at the front tyres. Those cameras are of course also useful for keeping trendy 22-inch alloys pristine through pesky width restrictions. Eventually, we did reach the end of Van Zyl's Pass and transitioned onto the stretch of land that he named after his wife. This is the Marienfluss. Wow, look at this. Suddenly, it just goes from red sand to fine white sand up here. That is one of the most extraordinary sights I've ever seen. Now, fun though rock crawling is, or rather engaging, I suppose. This is much more like it. This is my sort of territory. Back in sand mode, high ratio, bit more speed, car moving around. This suits me down to the ground. The steering's light, which can feel a bit sort of off-putting, but actually it's also accurate. There's far less steering lock needed than you know, an old, Defender through here would be kind of terrifying in a way, actually, because although you'd feel more connection, you wouldn't have anything like the precision that you've got in this. When this starts to slide, you add a bit of lock in, and it's it's right there. You know where it is. I love driving in sand; it's just so much fun. Now, just to show that it's not actually all fun and games out here, and what can happen if you do happen to have an accident, here's one we prepared earlier, as they say on Blue Peter. This was apparently fleeing Angola during the war in the 80s, and uh, had an accident, it was abandoned. Interestingly, if we look along here on the dash, you can see the inspiration for the new one in there. Hm. May it rest, or rather rust, in peace. After a morning at such slow speed on Van Zyl's Pass, it felt like we really needed to cover ground out here, and the Defender was often drifting through bends at 60, 70 or even 80 miles an hour as we headed west towards the coast. We followed a dry riverbed, then thundered down through vast and varied valleys. We passed Tutankhamun Mountain, we saw Giraffe. There were landscapes that looked like the moon, and there were landscapes that looked like Mars. 
Each new vista seemed to be trying to outdo the previous one for sheer gobsmacking grandeur. It was almost a relief to stop for a puncture. By the time we got to camp for the night, I felt almost oversaturated with all the driving I'd done and the things I'd seen. But of course, no sun doesn't mean there's nothing to see. With so little light pollution, a bit of stargazing seemed very much in order. And the advantage of having something with a ladder up to a roof rack is that I don't have to mingle with all the scorpions or anything bigger that's out there, for that matter. How high can lions jump? Right, hat, get that one. Head torch, so I can see the ladder and that. Right. Having successfully avoided becoming a midnight meal on wheels, the golden dawn on day three saw us striking out into the Namib, which means vast place. This is the world's oldest desert, at a vintage of at least 50 million years. More specifically, we were heading with specially granted permission to the Skeleton Coast. Let's talk about the actual car that we have got here. It is a Defender 110, fairly obviously, so we know we're gonna get the Defender 90 as well, and there'll be the commercial vehicle, and then there will be a P-HEV. However, for the moment, we have got the top of the range petrol engine, which is the P400 M-HEV. So this is also a mild hybrid, in fact. What that means is under the bonnet, we've got a six cylinder, three litre petrol engine with a turbocharger. And then on the back of that, there is an electric motor, uh, which rather like um, well, various other ones we've seen, Audi's done it, uh, Mercedes has done it. You know, it charges the 48 volt electrical system. Oh, watch out for the stones. Not your usual piece of camera, because I do have to watch the road a little more than I would do otherwise. As I was saying, B400 MF, and that charges the uh, 48 volt electrical system. It also runs an electrical supercharger, uh, which obviously helps build boost pressure. It doesn't do what the uh, EQ boost system does in the Mercedes, which is sort of add power through the electric motor itself. But I have to say, it feels pretty good. It's very responsive, this engine, certainly. It's putting out 394 brake horsepower and 406 pounds foot of torque. And despite weighing 2,300 kilos, just over actually, it does 0 to 60 miles an hour in 5.8 seconds, which is pretty impressive. So this Defender is really sort of, it's an off-road hot hatch to that extent. Despite this particular 110 coming in at the best part of two and a half tonnes with all the kit on the roof, it really didn't drive like the lumbering 4x4 you might expect. It's obviously no Lotus, but the way it responded to throttle and steering really did belie its weight. Think perhaps of the balletic hippos in Disney's Fantasia. And talking of balletic, here is possibly the world's most ungainly race. Explains why I'm slightly out of breath for this next bit. It's known as the Skeleton Coast originally because of all the whale bones and fish bones that were washed up here, but then subsequently for all the shipwrecks that have been here, some of which can be now found up to two kilometres inland because that's the way the sands have moved. Incidentally, this is also home to one of the world's largest sand dunes at nearly 400 metres in height. To put that in perspective, the Shard is only 310 metres high. The driving that followed was some of the most demanding I've ever experienced. Speed, dust, water, rocks, sand, mud, deep mud, high ratio, then high suspension. The concentration and constant adaptation to the terrain was mentally exhausting, even if the Defender kept me physically far more isolated from the impacts than I'd expected. 
In terms of the terrain response modes, we obviously use rock crawl quite a bit in Van Zils for obvious reasons. The other one we've used an awful lot, and in fact which I'm in at the moment, is the sand mode. We've obviously used it on the Skeleton Coast, but we're going down a riverbed at the moment, which is mostly dry, and sand mode is the best for this. What that does is, as you can hear, it holds onto the gear. It also gives you a very sort of quite a soft throttle for the first sort of 20% and after that a very responsive throttle. So it means that you can be very gentle when you're getting away, but also then when you need to suddenly have a lot of response to get through the you know, patch of soft sand, which can be completely unapparent to be honest as you're approaching it, then you've got all that response straight away to help dig yourself out of it. Springbok. Hardly David Attenborough levels of insight there, although I'm not sure he would have much to say about cars. And here we can see a new Defender in its preferred habitat. Born only recently, it nonetheless has to adapt quickly, if it is to survive in these harsh surroundings. And then we saw some more actual wildlife. I think if there's one animal I could have wished to see on this trip, it would have been a lion. But, but second was an elephant, and it is just amazing to see it. That's a, a bull elephant. Uh, we think sort of probably not too old. I mean, it could live anything up to sort of 50 years old. What a thrill. Wow, so cool. We've got another elephant up here. It looks enormous, this one. <gasps> Apparently he's right on our route. If his ears are pinned back, then he's coming for you. Let me hear that. If his ears are pinned back and he starts charging, he's coming for you. If they're out, it's a fake charge. Needless to say, I kept a keen eye on his outboard radiators. And this was still on my mind when we eventually, finally, got stuck a few minutes later. We didn't even have the worst of it, as this footage from a few days later shows. Eventually we waded, squelched, scrabbled and drifted our way to, bizarrely, the Manchester United trading post. Which made me wonder, will the new Defender be deemed fashionable enough to be seen in players' car parks outside Manchester United over here? Or Chelsea for that matter. Or Arsenal. And now we're back on to well, what I'm now classifying as road, in normal life, this wouldn't be a road, but after what we've been through, this feels like a road. And that's really the end of the, the off-road section of this trip. And I just thought I'd take a minute to, well, think about how the car has survived. The vibrations that have gone through this car, sort of, before you get to the, the big impacts, we haven't had any warning lights on at all. It hasn't been sort of serviced every night or anything like that, they've just filled it up with fuel. But, yeah, the abuse these can take, it's phenomenal. One question I did ask was, how much of this route could a discovery have done? Because a lot of people have said, well, this really is just a Discovery 5 in a lumberjack shirt and some steel toe cap boots. And to that I would say, well, yes, but if you drop a brick on some normal shoes, then you're not going to walk very far. Because I think, from what I understand, a discovery, in terms of sheer traction, could do pretty much most, if not all, of what this could do. In some situations, you'd probably need a more skilled driver to do some of the things um, than you would in this. Less skilled driver. But in terms of the departure angles, the breakover angle, and the general robustness, this is a step above. We've barely touched the underbelly of this, which is extraordinary given what we've been through. And some of the step ups that by the end we're just taking for granted, and yet this, it's unbelievable to be honest, to me. And those are the things where a Discovery just wouldn't be able to do it, or any other SUV for that matter. There's also to bear in mind that this has the D7X chassis as opposed to the Discovery which has the D7U and this is also sort of tougher to that extent in terms of you know, standing up to, like I said before, 
the vibrations, the impacts, all that sort of thing. It also has stronger lower arms for when you're going over the rocks, etc. And what if it does all go wrong? This area of Namibia is the second least densely populated region in the world behind Mongolia, just 2.6 people per square kilometer. So out here, there wouldn't be much help to fix all those computers that make this a defender for the 21st century. Well, the new Defender is capable of running software over the air updates and diagnostics for its 14 modules. Even more reassuringly, if there is a fault, then the limp home modes have been specifically designed with much more leeway in mind, so it shouldn't lock you out of the capabilities you might need in order to extricate yourself from whatever extreme environment or even danger you're in. To be honest, I felt like I would probably expire before the car, given the intensity of the driving we'd been doing. It's so draining because you are constantly looking, you know, all at once straight ahead of you trying to spot the rock that might give you a puncture, but also trying to work out have you got to pick up momentum to carry speed through a river or a mud section, and then what's beyond that, you're, you've got other vehicles around, then you're dealing with the dust from them as well. You're trying to keep the tyres straight and be sort of gentle, smooth with your inputs, in order to not add too much lock, but equally be aggressive when you need to be. And it's, it is that curious thing of, of being gentle at one moment and then really very sort of almost angry with the car <laughs> the next. You know, you're used to on the road or on a circuit, say, the straights are the easy bits. You know, you just plant your right foot and off you go. Here, just because there isn't a corner doesn't mean you won't have to slow down because you've got that extra dimension of, is there a dip there? How big is that dip? What's that step doing there? Is that soft ground? Is it hard ground? Can you go through it at full tilt or not? There is so much to think about, and I've, I've loved that, but also found it extremely tiring over the last few days. As we rolled back into the bustling relative metropolis of Apu at the end of three incredible days, I couldn't help but reflect. I had wanted a test of both robustness and capability for the Defender, and boy had we got one. As examinations go, it really doesn't get much more gruelling than overlanding through Africa. There is obviously a lot more to come from this Defender story. We need to drive it more on tarmac roads to start with. But there's the 90, the commercial, the PHEV, all those things. But for now, what this has proved is that the new Defender is very at home out here which is somehow good to know, even if most of them do end up finding homes somewhere more like here. <laughs> <laughs>